Good evening. I'm Roxana Marcoch, Senior Curator of Photography, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening together with my colleague, Sara Suzuki, Curator in Drawings and Prints, and my co-curator of the exhibition A Revolutionary Impulse, The Rise of the Russian Avant-Garde, on view at the Museum of Modern Art through March 12. Conceived in conjunction with the centennial of the Russian Revolution, this exhibition examines the remarkable sense of creative urgency, intersectionality between the literary, performative, and visual arts, and the sphere of industrial production, and the socio-political agency that the Russian avant-garde inaugurated in the arc of 1912 to 1935, changing the course of modern history. Focused on the years right before World War I through the 1917 revolution and the completion of the first industrial five-year plan, the installation brings together experimental cross-media projects exclusively from a mass collection. How can revolution exist in an object, in an artistic process, in a theoretization of art? And how can a new artistic praxeology give expression to reformist social structures and ideological values? These are some of the questions that this evening's panel, the Russian avant-garde, scholars respond, is raising. In the winter of 1927-28, the 26-year-old art historian Alfred Barr, on leave from his academic studies at Harvard and his teaching duties at Wellesley, embarked on a two-month trip to Soviet Union, which would be consequential to his modernist education. As he wrote in his diary, and I quote Barr, apparently there is no place where talent of an artistic or literary sort is so carefully nurtured as in Moscow. We'd rather be here than on any place on earth. Two days after his arrival in Moscow, Barr visited the progressive writer Sergei Tretyakov, co-founder of the journals LEF, an acronym for Left Front of the Arts, and Novi Lev, New Left, a complete run which is on view in this exhibition. At Tretyakov's place, Barr met with a loosely knit group of creative workers associated with these journals that included the artists Alexander Ochenko and Varvara Stepanova, the poets Vladimir Mayakovsky and Nikolai Asev, film director Sergei Eisenstein and Ziga Vertov, and literary theorist Osip Brick and Viktor Sklovsky. Both Tretyakov and Ochenko wanted to be regisseur. And Bard noted that all the arts in Russia, including music, tend constantly toward the condition of cinema. Barr was right in his assessment. The Soviet Union was a society on the cusp of the modern media age. Mass politics demanded mass messaging. A year later, Barr would go on to become the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art, and his encounter with the Russian avant-garde was constitutive to his vision of MoMA as a laboratory, a place of critical inquiry, analysis, and communication. Before inviting Sarah to introduce our distinguished panelist and talk a little bit about the structure of tonight's panel, I would like to extend our profound thanks to Olga Miller, and to the Renova group of companies for making this program possible. Also, special thanks for their support in the conceptualization of this event are due to our colleagues, Jay Levinson, director of the international program, Xenia Nuril, the CIMAP fellow for Central and Eastern Europe, Hilary Redder, curatorial assistant in drawings and prints and curatorial assistant of this exhibition, and Linnea West, the CIMAP program assistant in the international program at MoMA. Sarah? Thanks so much, Roxana, and thanks to you all for joining us here tonight. We're really thrilled to have you, and we're equally as thrilled to have five fantastic presentations coming up tonight. After the five presentations, I'm going to introduce all the speakers now, so they'll follow each other one immediately after the next on stage. And at the conclusion of the presentations, we'll all get together um, on stage here for a Q&A, and we hope you'll have some great questions for us. 
So to introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present, Masha Chlanova is an art historian and curator specializing in modern art with a focus on the Russian avant-garde. Her work has appeared in the journal October and in exhibition catalogs published by the Guggenheim, Tate Modern, the Royal Academy in London, and MoMA, where she contributed to our major survey, Inventing Abstraction, 1910 to 25. She organized the first extensive presentation of the Polish abstract artist of the 20s, Václav Szapowski, which is currently on view at Miguel Abreu Gallery downtown. She teaches art history at New School University and is currently working on a small scale exhibition dedicated to the centennial of the Russian Revolution, which will open this fall at the International Print Center here in New York. Our second speaker is Maria Goff. Maria is the Joseph Pulitzer Jr. Professor of Modern Art in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. Goff specializes in the Russian and Soviet avant-garde and French modernism. She also writes about contemporary art. Among her recent publications are You Can Draw With Whatever You Like in the Cubism Seminars, The Newsreader in On Kawara Silence, published by the Guggenheim, Model Exhibition in October, Architecture as Such in Tate Modern's Malevich Catalog, and Drawing Between Reportage and Memory, Diego Rivera's Moscow Sketchbook, also in October. A recipient of fellowships from CASVA, Getty, the Clark Art Institute, the Radcliffe Institute, and the Guggenheim Foundation, Goff is currently completing two book manuscripts, one on the drawings of Gustav Klutzis, and another on the photographic practices of foreign travelers in the Soviet Union during the 1930s. Our third presentation will come from Devin Fore, associate professor in the German department at Princeton University. His forthcoming book, All the Graphs, Soviet Factography and the Emergence of Avant-Garde Documentary situates the multimedia work of Sergei Trechikov within the material culture of the early Soviet period. With Matthew Witkowski, he's worked on the international exhibition Demonstration, Soviet Art Put to the Test, which will open in Venice this summer before traveling to Chicago and to Moscow. Christian Romberg is Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a specialist in the history of modern and contemporary art with a specific focus on media and design. She's currently organizing Propositions on Revolution, an exhibition of contemporary art that explores revolution as a broad conceptual category, which will open at the Cranert Museum later this year. She's also at work on a forthcoming book that re-examines Russian constructivism through Alexei Gon's work as a political organizer and maker of mass media objects. And our final speaker tonight will be Christina Kerr, who teaches modern art at Northwest Northwestern University. She's the author of Imagine No Possessions, The Socialist Objects of Russian Constructivism, and the forthcoming Collective Body, Alexander Danica and the Lyrical Prospects of Socialist Realism. Her current research project is entitled An Aesthetics of Anti-Racism, African Americans in Soviet Visual Culture. And she's co-curator with Robert Byrd and Zach Cahill of the exhibition Revolution Every Day, opening in September of this year at the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And I'd like you now to welcome with me Masha, our first presenter. Good evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Roxana, for this invitation. It's an honor to be part of such a distinguished panel in such a venerable institution and amazing exhibition. I will be talking about Alfred Barr, MoMA, and the Russian avant-garde. On the night of his arrival to Moscow, on December 1926, let's see. There you go. Alfred Barr, the future founding director of MoMA, wrote in his diary, we feel as if this were the most important place in the world for us to be. It is impossible to describe the feeling of exhilaration. Perhaps it is the extraordinary spirit of forward-looking, gay hopefulness of Russians, their awareness that Russia has at least a century of greatness before her." End quote. Barr found this enthusiasm and idealistic aspirations embodied in the works of Russian artists he met during his two months' stay. Sergei Tretikov, Alexander Rochenko, El Lizitsky, Vladimir Tatlin, Sergei Eisenstein, and many others. 
This visit planted the seeds that, of what became Barr's lifelong interest in Russian modernism. During his tenure at MoMA from 1929 until 1968, Barr played an instrumental role in assembling one of the most outstanding collections of Russian avant-garde outside of Russia. In what follows, I will offer a brief historical account of Barr's first significant public presentation of Russian avant-garde in his seminal exhibition, Cubism and Abstract Art, held in the spring of 1936. Many important works came to the collection from this exhibition, um, and together with its catalog, it became an essential resource for Western scholars at least until the early 1960s. Barr's focus on the stylistic developments of modernism, diagrammed in his famous uh, flowchart printed on the catalog cover, and his spacious eye-level installations have come to stand for a purely formal approach that presents art in isolation from the social political context of its making. Yet, as Leah Dickerman has recently emphasized, Barr's work on this exhibition was fundamentally a project of retrieval, rescue, and preservation of abstraction, which was facing a growing threat under the Nazi regime. Barr's first-hand experience of the mounting attack on modernism during his stay in, Nazi Germ in Germany in 1932-33 and a return visit in 1935 gave a special sense of urgency to this project. Barr dedicated his exhibition and catalog, quote, to those painters of squares and circles who have suffered at the hands of Philistines with political power, end quote. Barr's active engagement with the artistic practices of the Russian avant-garde in the mid-1930s had a major social political significance as well. For his scholarship, collecting an exhibition firmly inscribed them into the history of international modernism precisely at the moment when they were being displaced from the public sphere in the Soviet Union, their legacy confined to the past and eradicated. Following his initial visit to Russia, Barr incorporated his knowledge of Soviet avant-garde into the pioneering course in modern art he was teaching at Wellesley and wrote and published several articles on Russian art. He kept the connection with Soviet artists through his correspondence with Olga Tretyakova, the wife, uh, the English-speaking wife of the playwright and key avant-gardist Sergei Tretikov, who served, and she also served as Barr's liaison with Roshenko, Stepanova, Eisenstein, and the others. When Barr set out to prepare Cubism and abstract art, Russian artists were aware of and respected his commitment to their work. In the mid-1930s, Barr's main liaison in Moscow was Jay Leda, a young filmmaker who moved there in 1933 to study with Eisenstein. Barr asked Leda to help him get a few works by Rochenko, Malevich, Lizitsky, and Tadlin, who, he said, are the four artists he deemed the most important for the exhibition. First, Leda tried the official channel, the Society of Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries, known by its Russian acronym VOX. In response to Soviet authorities' hesitation, Barr issued a reassurance, quote, we have no desire to create the impression that the abstract and constructivist movement is in any way characteristic of contemporary Soviet art. Our exhibition is strictly a historical matter." End quote. Barr consented that a brief historical account of the development of constructivist and abstract movements be written by the Soviet critic Osip Beskin. Little did Barr know that Beskin had just published a widely circulated, a highly influential account of, he, of the history of, 20, of Russian, 20th century Russian art, which completely dismissed both of these movements as nefarious remnants of a pre-revolutionary bourgeois mentality. It quickly became clear, however, that Barr could not get any loans for the official channels. And he wrote to Leda that he would like to make do with the works he had. Quote, I have all I want of Malevich, Barr wrote. And he is the most important individual in the Russian section. The rest I shall do by a few loans from American collectors, and photographs of constructions. Of course, I'm getting what I need from Gabo and Pevsner and Lizitsky from this period I want. Rochenko and Tatlin will have to be represented by photographs." End quote. The origin of MoMA's um, outstanding collection of Malevich's works is well known. Barr handpicked 21 works from a trove of nearly 100 Malevich left behind at his retrospective in Berlin in 1927 where by the time of Barr's visit in 1935, these modernists, uh, uh, his colleague Alexander Dorner of the Hanover Museum risked his life in protecting these modernist treasures from the Nazis. The well-known legend that Barr brought two of Malevich's canvases wrapped around his umbrella um, reflects the salvaging aspect of his, of his mission. Most importantly, Barr's swift acquisition secured Malevich's place 
at the center of the Russian avant-garde in the West at that early moment and continues to dictate his dominant role in MoMA's display of Russian works today. It is at this point in December of 1935 that Leda went to the artist's Moscow studios to ask for loans in earnest. And soon he sent to Barr several books on paper and photographs of constructions given to him by Roshenko, Tatlin, and Stepanova. Original constructions were difficult to transport. Um, and their photographs suited perfectly for Barr's means of showcasing the constructivist project. Barr was ecstatic. He found that the Tatlin material is especially important since he wrote, quote, it confirms my opinion that Tatlin is a far more the founder of constructivism than Pevsner and Gabo, who are ordinarily given credit in Western Europe and America, end quote. Leda corroborated Barr's intuition, writing from Moscow. Without exception, everyone refers to Pevsner and Gabo as imposters, who never participated with the constructivist group here, but stole their principles, took them to Paris with them, and sold themselves as inventors and masters of constructivism, end quote. This direct exchange enabled Barr to straighten the historical account of constructivism at this early stage of its institutionalization, at least in the United States. Barr strove for historical accuracy, but his task was a careful balancing act. He often had to rely on information he received from the artists, who were ne rarely neutral in the task of shaping their reception. Thus, Mikhail Larionov and Natalia Goncharova, who lived in Paris since 1918, secured their place among the pioneers of abstraction by ever so slightly backdating their, the paintings, the raised pictures they gave to MoMA, and occasionally followed the common trend of supplementing the works they actually had with additional ones they made in a similar style. In his turn, Rochenko himself himself stood at the source of the first efforts to institutionalize the avant-garde, having served as the head of the museum bureau of the Commissariat for Enlightenment, which used the state funds between 1918 and 21 to acquire nearly 2,000 works of contemporary Russian art for the newly created network of museums of artistic culture, which were an important inspiration for Barr's own shaping of MoMA. Rochenko gave MoMA a select group of drawings made between 1918 and 21, which illustrated the crucial moment of his transition from composition to construction. Barr faithfully showed the sequence, you see on the left, bottom corner, in Cubism and Abstract Art and reproduced it in the catalog. The hanging of Cubism and Abstract Art was not always spacious. Many walls resembled collages that mixed original works, photo reproductions, colored copies, documentation, and curatorial text for educational goals. The narrative flow of the exhibition within the gallery spaces, and you can see arrows above the installations. Um, sorry. Underscored by graphic arrows was in sync with the didactic aim of, of his flow chart to expound the teleological development of modernist styles inscribed within a network of artistic exchange. Malevich was fortunate to get a mini retrospective Yet information given ab even about his, his works was scarce in 1936. Um, so scarce that Barr hung two of his earliest suprematist paintings from the landmark 010 exhibition upside down. Um, an anxiety that has plagued curators and publishers of abstraction ever since. Although Malevich himself occasionally changed the orientation of his paintings, he never did so for Boy with a Knapsack. Scholars found this original title only decades later, and MoMA long hesitated to abandon Barr's black square and red square, which, fit, which better fit the institution's focus on the modernist preoccupation with form. In the spring of 1936, Leda brought copies of the exhibition catalog to the artist who gave him materials for the exhibition. It gave them enormous support to know that their abstract work found interested audiences and a place in history, and motivated them to further strengthen Mormon's collection. When Leda came to Rochenko and Stepanova, they were in the midst of cleaning their studio. Leda elatedly reported to Barr, quote, at the height of their incredulous enthusiasm over the fact that there may still be a museum that was interested in their work, they promised to put everything aside that might excite me instead of throwing it away. This would include drawings, prints, photos, posters, documents, theater stuff, movie stuff, magazines, books, book jackets, 
They wouldn't believe me when I swore that the museum would find a place and a use for any of this material, unquote. Thus, many more works um, by the artist couple found their way to MoMA shortly after the exhibition. Vladimir Tatlin's work, on the other hand, remained conspicuously absent from the exhibition and the collection, with the exception of the brochure with photographs of his reliefs published in 1915, which Tatlin lent on the strict condition that it be returned. Later sought to remedy this gap. Tatlin, he reported, quote, ate up his copy of the catalog, while his real dinner stood forgotten. Leda shamed him that he was the only artist from whom the museum was able to show no original work. He noted that Tatlin was not ashamed but flattered by the difficulty, but nevertheless promised that he would give something to Leda to take with him to New York. Leda warned Barr that, quote, unlike the other former constructivists I've met here, I didn't know Malevich, Tatlin has a profound, even holy respect for the every piece of paper or tin that he worked on and demands the same, reference from all, the same reverence from all guests, no matter how scornful they may be about constructivism outside his studio. Later, he expected that Tatlin would, give, would drive a bargain, which he thought would be no more than asking for books. But his actual request came as a surprise, for the work reproduced on the cover of his 1915 brochure, which he described as one of the most important constructions I ever did, Tatlin asked for, quote, a motorcycle. Indian or Harley Davidson, latest model, without sidecar, quote. Barr abruptly dismissed the request. Quote, I am afraid the museum would not be particularly interested in the Tatlin construction offered in exchange for the motorcycle, even if I had the money. I don't have the illustration here, this is still Barr, I don't have the illustration here, but recall that he refers to an early construction of perhaps 1913, which shows little advance over Picasso's Cubist constructions of that year. I have almost no money to spend on works of art, and to be quite frank, Tatlins have almost no commercial value." End quote. Barr's memory was mistaken. For the work reproduced on the front of the brochure was indeed among Tatlin's most important constructions, the corner counter-relief first shown at the Zero Ten exhibition in December 1915. It was possibly the best work Tatlin had access to in 1936, and only as a reconstruction he himself made around 1925, um, using some of the original fragments. It was last shown in the Russian Museum in Leningrad in 1932 and remained dismantled in its storage until the late 1980s. Made of perishable materials and deliberately defying commercial value, only a couple of original works by Tatlin have survived. Now MoMA proudly owns an original copy of Tatlin brochure, which it acquired six years ago. Perhaps Tatlin's exaggerated reverence for his art artistic output in the mid-1930s was a sort of com compensatory mechanism for his isolation, as already by 1933 his abstraction was firmly condemned for formalism, while his major project, the flying apparatus of Tatlin, was dismissed as a non-functional invention, prompting Tatlin to, Tatlin to betray his position of an artist as someone who gives ideas, as he, he put it, by joining the Society of Inventors on the one hand and publicly announcing his return to easel painting on the other. Whatever the case may be, had Tatlin been more generous, perhaps MoMA would have owned some of his original works, but his place in history has been firmly secured by photographic reproductions, the method that satisfied Barr's, Barr's rigorous standards in 1936. After New York, Cubism and abstract art traveled to seven more American cities albeit in a smaller format, for another year, expounding the principles of modernism to the broad masses of American population. Within it, Russian avant-garde practices were firmly inscribed into the international modernist network, which stood in opposition to the rising nationalist projects in Europe and the Soviet Union. Between 1932 and 1934, two massive reviews of Soviet art held in major museums in Leningrad and Moscow completed the stigmatization of radical modernist practices, which were dismissed as an aberration of the past that was finally and definitively overcome. This official narrative was also broadcast in the United States on an unprecedented scale, which following the diplomatic recognition of the Soviet Union in 1933, a major exhibition of Soviet art was held at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 
in 1934-35, organized jointly with the American Russian Institute under the patronage of the two newly appointed ambassadors. The Institute's vice chairman and the show's curator, Christian Brinton, stressed the need for a proud national identity of Russian art and stated that, quote, by 1924, or just a decade ago, modernism as such was a dead issue in the USSR. And again, it was Leda who set the historical account straight for Bar in 1936. Quote, contrary to what you will be told by official organizations, constructivism did not die a natural death here. It was consciously wiped out for reasons which possibly are quite logical. Quote. Leda, in turn, played an instrumental role in preserving the legacy of Soviet avant-garde film in MoMA's film library, where he worked between 1936 and 1940. Thus, already in 1936, Barr was writing a parallel history of Russian art focusing on the movements that were written off official Soviet history, preserving them and giving them a future. Barr's chapters on Russian, on Russian art in the catalog for Cubism and Abstract Art, while hardly entirely accurate or complete, became a rare and cherished resource in the West, at least, at least until the publication of Camilla Gray's account in 1962. After the war, Barr again stood up strongly to protect modernism from the Philistines with political power. Now they were the McCarthy conservators of his own country. In 1952, Barr published a polemical article in the New York Times entitled, Is Modern Art Communistic? Where he reminded the reader that modern works were feared and suppressed as subversive in both Soviet and Nazi dictatorships, and denounced the McCarthy tenet that modern art was a Soviet communist conspiracy as a fantastic falsehood. Barr continued to keep a keen eye on the Soviet Union and made two more trips there during Khrushchev's thaw in 1956 and, 1950, and again in 1959 when he caused a considerable stir with his lectures about MoMA and its collection and a documentary film about Jackson Pollock, met George Kosaki, the foremost collector of Russian avant-garde in the USSR, and brought back to MoMA a group of works by talented young nonconformist artists such as Dmitry Plavinsky and Vladimir Nemuchin. Barr's continued resistance to oppressive ideological regimes of any kind went hand in hand with his commitment to radical artistic pursuits. His focused persistence and curatorial rigor set high standards for MoMA's inception, from MoMA's inception and remain an example to follow. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Roxana and Sarah and uh, their wonderful team, and also uh, to you all for coming. Um, let me see if I can... Good. Okay. In the final gallery of the exhibition upstairs, uh, we find this magnificent drawing in charcoal, ink, and gouache by Alexander Veznin, the story of which, or a story of which, I want to try to tell in the next 15 minutes or less. Um, just in the light of Marsha's talk, uh, this uh, drawing was not acquired uh, by Alfred Barr. It rather entered the museum's collections in uh, 1979. Dating to spring 1921, it belongs to a liminal moment in Vesnin's practice, marking his transition from an avant-garde vernacular of cubo-futurism to a then emerging radical constructivism. In this drawing, Vesnin offers a dynamic terrain of outdoor agitational activity, the form of which is clearly borrowed from his contemporaneous work in the theater. Two massive triangular hoardings, uprighted to stand on their corners, cluster together with a sphere and a cone to form a backdrop against which a soldier turned orator, standing on a podium composed of two stacked cubes, brandishes his rifle triumphantly before an unseen crowd. A staircase runs up and down while a tr truncated cylinder and other volumes provide second and third stages for action. Despite their dislocation, letters and word fragments nevertheless shout out familiar rallying cries, long live the, th um, the Third International, workers of the world unite. Throughout the drawing, 
form is schematized and the modeling of volume reduced to roughly brushed tricolor of red black and the ground of the once white paper, such that in this respect at least, it resembles one of Fernand Leger's cubist drawings, his so-called contrasts of forms. More puzzling here, however, is the network of lines drawn in charcoal that crisscross across the sheet, partially enve enveloping this cubo-futurist ensemble. It is in the distribution of these lines that the artist hesitates the most, especially at the left, where he draws and erases several times over, littering the sheet with pentimenti. But by the end, he arrives at three sets of guy lines, each set staying a pole or a mast, a tall one in the center flanked by, on either side by a smaller one. But given that this network has no or very little structural function in terms of, say, supporting or stabilizing those massive hoardings, what is it that Vesnan is eager to get right here? Before trying to answer this question, a few words of introduction are in order. Alexander Vesnan is best known today as one of the founders of constructivist architecture in 1923. But this drawing, which dates to 1921, as I mentioned at the outset, belongs to a five-year interregnum uh, in his arch architectural practice following the revolution. When he turned away from the field of his pre-revolutionary training and professional occupation to, to pursue easel painting on one hand and theater and festival design on the other. It was during these years, especially around 1920 and 21, that he grew close to the constructivists in the Moscow Institute of Artistic Culture, some of whom you see here in this after-dinner photograph taken by Rochenko. In the center, smoking his pipe, is Zeznin. To his left is Popova, argui arguably the key figure in his aesthetic radicalization in the late teens and early 1920s. They had met a decade earlier in a private painting studio and encountered one another again from time to time thereafter. In 1916, Vesnan and his brothers, who were also professional architects, designed a chapel on the grounds of a large textile factory owned by Popova's father, Sergei, who was a wealthy industrialist. When Popova returned to Moscow in 1919 after the untimely death of her husband, an art historian, she and Vesnan formed a creative and romantic partnership that continued through to her premature death from scarlet fever in 1924. I foreground these biographical details because um, this drawing uh, is, or Vesnan's drawing, uh, belongs or is at least very closely related to a large-scale collaborative project that he and Popova embarked upon together in spring 1921. This highly schematic uh, ink rendering of their collaboration presents their final concept for the design of a truly massive outdoor spectacle, essentially a theatricalized military parade involving thousands of army personnel and vast quantities of military vehicles and equipment. Though never realized, this mass action directed by Meyerhold and titled The Struggle and the Victory of the Soviets was based on a scenario written by the critic Aksyonov. Over the course of 12 episodes, the closed form citadel of capitalism, shown at left in the drawing, was to be transformed into the open industrial and worker-owned city of the future on the right. This transformation from closed to open, from opacity to transparency, along with the pared down rhetoric of the rendering itself, exemplify constructivism's push to lay bare its own mode of construction, even if neither artist had as yet signed on to the laboratory constructivism rapidly uh, developing in the Institute of Artistic Culture that spring. Suspended between these two cities, 
the citadel of capitalism and the city of the future, the communist city of the future, is a massive web of cables pulled taut by the tethering to the ground of the aerostats in the sky to which they are attached, providing an armature for the proclamation of one revolutionary slogan after another, the collective chorus of which was designed to welcome foreign delegates to the Third Congress of the Third International, which was being held in Moscow that summer. Seated on a dedicated podium, the delegates were to be encouraged, indeed exhorted, by this spectacular demonstration of the struggle and the victory of the Soviets, so that they too might help to bring the revolution home. Flying propaganda was how Lizitsky and Mart Stamm captioned the drawing when they reproduced it in the Swiss journal ABC in 1926. So in addition to Vezin's drawing, a total of four objects um, from their collabor collaborative undertaking survive to this day. The co-signed presentation drawing I just discussed, uh, Popova's uh, detailed uh, preliminary elaboration of the city of future, which includes a gantry uh, crane that would reappear in one of her uh, later productions, and then uh, two models, um, uh, both unsigned but photographed in her studio by Rodchenka after uh, her death. Common to all, despite other differences, is the enveloping radial network of lines extending diagonally to the ground that we saw earlier. What does this network uh, signify? For one writer, it signifies a ship's rigging, for another, the guy lines of a circus tent. Closer to the mark, I think, if we're playing the referent game, might be this, a field of radio uh, transmission uh, antennae. This particular example was erected in 1907 at the wireless telegraphy radio station built by Hermann uh, Mutesius in now in Germany, uh, to which Lizitsky referred in print in an essay he published adjacent to Popova and Vesna's drawing in ABC. I'm not suggesting that they necessarily had this field in mind for their project, but rather that the then now communication tele, uh, technologies of wireless telegraphy and radio broadcasting had a place in their aesthetic imaginary, just as they, as they did for so many of their contemporaries. Consider, for example, uh, Rochenko's oblique angle uh, photograph of a soldier with his bayonet rifle guarding the newly constructed Shukov radio uh, tower in Moscow. And this photograph is to the left of the drawing in the final gallery of the exhibition. Or perhaps more specifically, that major uh, precedent that looms over uh, their project. Uh, Vladimir Tatlin's proposal for a monument to the Third International, the model for which was on display in central Moscow in spring 1921. Recasting uh, the monument form um, as, in, into the, in, or as an operational building, Tatlin proposes here a skeletal armature in the form of a double spiral that would encase the busy headquarters of the International each of its revolving geometric volumes housing a different branch of the latter's administration. Near the top, a half sphere, uh, for example, was to contain the International's own radio station, which was to revolve on its own axis once an hour. Tatlin's architecture, in other words, embodying the rhythms of radio's hourly news bulletin. And at the very, very top, uh, we can just make out a rudimentary armature of wooden rods that resists or otherwise resists the diagonal thrust of the tower. This is surely modeling the radio antenna by means of which the Comintern would transmit to the world. In fact, uh, Tatlin's published, uh, published elevation drawing uh, on the right, uh, a detail on the left, confirms his intention and there is another detail here that likely intrigued Popova and Vesnin. It's in the lower left corner of the elevation. The antenna that, uh, oops, the antenna that uh, Tatlin mounts atop an existing building, doubtless a receiving antenna for transmissions from Radio Comintern. So perhaps we might think of those um, 
Sorry. Uh, oops. So perhaps we might think of those uh, charcoal lines which persist throughout uh, their collaboration, as we've seen, as sig signaling the possibility and indeed desirability of technological transmission, such that the live mass action performed in Moscow might also be listened to in real time across Soviet Russia and beyond. Live agitational speech delivered by a soldier turned orator, in other words, will no longer be limited by the finite reach of his voice, but be transmitted far and wide. Vesnan brought this conviction with him when he embarked uh, in 1923 on what is widely regarded as the first work of constructivist architecture proper his competition project for the Palace of Labor, a collaboration with his brothers, which, as you can see, is crowned with a hyperbole of antennae. The brothers even spell out in block letters, in case you don't get it, at the top of the drawing on the right, uh, the word antenna, which was the name they gave to their small collective of three, in case for some reason the jury might otherwise miss the point of their competition entry. It's provocative to think of the origins of constructivist architecture as lying, at least in part, in Vesnan's often forgotten collaboration with Popova some two years earlier. In fact, I like to think that his memory of that creative collaboration with his beloved is one of the reasons why he gave the drawing, along with one other, to his friend Le Corbusier in 1920, oops, 1928. Okay, I was going to show you the, uh, if you look at the drawing upstairs, you'll, or if you have seen it, you'll notice that in the lower left corner, there's a very warm uh, dedication to the uh, uh, Swiss uh, architect in which Vesnan expresses his um, uh, deep respect and affection uh, for him. Anyway, here uh, they both are. Uh, in Vesnan's studio, one of his paintings uh, in the rear ground there, um, uh, in the company also of his brothers and a number of other architects. Corbusier, for his part, did not arrive uh, empty-handed uh, that evening. Uh, he brought with him one of uh, two recent uh, post-purist still lives um, uh, that he gave uh, to Vesnan on his first visit to the world's first worker state. Thank you. I'd like to um, start by thanking uh, Sarah and Roxana very much for the, for the generous invitation to speak tonight. Um, thank you. Um, when Alexander Rodchenko printed his 1927 photo of a stack of files on the cover of the avant-garde journal Novelyev, he added the slogan, down with bureaucratism. This handwritten injunction, which was placed in a white box and ran vertically along the left of the magazine's cover, recalls the tabs that could be found on the very files that Rodchenko was attacking. The original photograph on the left, whoops, the original photograph on the left shows the tragic fate of papers that have been filed away and forgotten, neutralized by an old information processing regime that stacks and imprisons documents that instead should be mobilized and put into circulation. In the credits on the last page of this issue, the editors, or perhaps it was Rochenko himself, uh, who offered a brief commentary on the photograph on the cover that explained why readers should rally against the folder as a storage medium. The comment reads, the corner of a chancery archive, a folder with papers that have been filed. It's dusty, it gets torn, it gets lost, it takes a long time to find. And so 
Protesting against this incarceration of the document in a dusty, forgotten corner of the archive, when Rodchenko puts the photograph on the cover of the journal, he rotates the image 90 degrees so that the fold of each file is now situated precariously at the top edge of the journal's cover, an orientation which, in real life, would of course cause the contents of the files to spill forth, bursting open and fluttering to the ground in a cascade of paper. In rotating the image in this way, then, Rochenko enacts quite literally his slogan, down with bureaucratism, by dumping the contents of these inert, dusty, cumbersome files out onto the floor, thereby liberating this knowledge and making it available for reorganization. On the one hand, Rochenko's gesture in 1927 of disgorging the contents of the archive protested against the inertia of a bureaucracy that threatened to neutralize the energies unleashed by the revolution one decade before as another example of the Soviet struggle against the inertia of bureaucracy, here is Lisitsky's 1928 press of freeze and a detail of the original newspaper that Lisitsky used here, which, as you see, shows the way that accumulated paper is put into circulation when this little obstructionist uh, bureaucrat is hoisted out of the way. More than just a critique of bureaucracy, though, Rochenko's rotation of his photograph also expressed a widespread conviction after the revolution that traditional institutions of knowledge needed to be reevaluated and reorganized. Thus came into being projects like a proletarian encyclopedia with search rubrics that differed from those found in traditional bourgeois encyclopedias, or the founding of a proletarian university based on pedagogical principles that combined abstract book knowledge with practical hands-on learning. But in order for this restructuring to take place, knowledge itself had to be unbound and reorganized. Indeed, Rochenko's photograph suggests that all of the facts and knowledge produced in these new institutions of learning would be of little use if the information architectures used to connect this knowledge were not changed as well. Immediate, immediately below the commentary to Rochenko's photograph, the editors of Nobilev stated their position on this new information architecture. They wrote, Lief is, for, or Lief is in favor of the card catalog system of record keeping. And just to give you a sense of how important this was, I would add that just below um, their statement, uh, collectively endorsing the card catalog, is another statement more recognizably constructivist um, in which they write that uh, Lief welcomes glass, iron, and concrete. This micromanagerial, oh wait, um, We'll come to that in a second. This micromanagerial intervention, down with the file folder, long live the card catalog, may lack the sexiness of other revolutionary slogans. <laughs> but its cultural ramifications are, in fact, immense. A number of media theorists from Cornelia Wissmann, Lisa Gittleman, and Markus Krajewski, just to name a few, have explored the consequences that replacing the filing cabinet with the card catalog has had on structures of knowledge and economies of thought. What the card catalog gives us is the radical discretization of knowledge, the restructuring of knowledge from a format that was fundamentally linear and closed to one that was nonlinear, reversible, and open. With this atomization of the cultural archive, with its decomposition into minimal and highly mobile units of information like index cards, these facts are disembedded from their past taxonomies and become available for continuous reordering, and dis uh, reordering revision, and rearrangement in new assemblages of knowledge. I quote another scholar who, who has written on the card catalog, Denis Ollier, who teaches at NYU. Ollier writes, quote, the card, ca the card file resists the syntagmatic closure of the sentence by sustaining the openness of the paradigm. It doesn't allow the phrase to gel, to take shape. It is indefinitely expandable, rhizomatic, since at any point of time or space, one can always insert a new card, in contradistinction with the sequential irreversibility of the pages of the notebook and of the book, the, its interior mobility allows for permanent reordering, unquote. In this regard, the card catalog exemplifies what Roland Barthes called, quote unquote, the very discontinuity that marks all critical discourse. Thus, if glass, iron, and concrete were the material basis for the revolution in constructed space, the nonlinear card catalog was the basis for the revolution in knowledge and information. Just to give you a further illustration of Rodchenko's commitment to newer information technologies like the card catalog, here's one of the objects that he built as a set designer for the film uh, that was titled Vasha Znakoma, or, or Your Female Friend, which he made um, the same year that he also made the photograph titled Down with Bureaucratism. 
This is an integrated multifunction console complete with a telephone, a radio antenna, um, a microform reader, and finally a number of drawers for index cards. In its infinite expandability and adaptability, this object is kind of the information uh, theoretical corollary to those morphologically vexing multi-purpose constructions being designed at the same time by Rodchenko's students at Frutemas. This is one sort of notorious design by Maroza from uh, 1926. This ensemble for information processing was so striking that it was highlighted in the promotional stills for the film and was prominently featured in the, uh, that's the promotional still on the left, and then it was also prominently featured in the poster that the Stenberg brothers made as well. And the, this, this piece of furniture was kind of in a way one of the stars of the film. In the film Vasha's Nakoma, this object belongs to a reporter who, has, who is identified as a quote-unquote enthusiast of NOT, or the Nauchnaya Organizatia Truda, or the Scientific Organization of Labor. This is the tidy man on the left in a suit with a neatly trimmed mustache who's, who's sort of living out the constructivist fantasy in which everything is in its orderly place. The association of the card system with a reporter who is also a follower of Note has, it seems, a concrete historical referent. This would be Platon Kierzhensev, one of the leading figures of the Note movement who was responsible for founding some of the major Soviet news agencies and who also published a series of books on the newspaper in the 1920s. Kierzhensev was indeed a passionate lover of the card system. So much so that one of his critics was once prompted to write, quote, if comrade Kershensev had his way, he would cover all of Russia with index cards in an instant. You and I would not even be able to glimpse the light of God from behind all of the index cards. The index cards would overshadow all of us in vivid life and in vivid deed, end quote. I introduced Kirzhensev not just because he exemplifies anecdotally a prevalent mania for card catalogs in Russia in the 1920s, but because he claimed that the same logic of discretization and recombination that was at work in the card catalog also had some purchase for our understanding of the human psyche. Just to give you an example of the kinds of card systems that Kirzhensev sought to introduce, here's what he called a time card on the right. He, uh, he, he founded a group that was called the League of Time that sought to introduce this kind of accounting for the self on a mass scale. Um, and this card shows the various hours of the day that's along the X axis on the top of the, um, uh, of, at the, top of the card and then um, the various activities along the Y axis which include sleeping and, um, and eating and attending lectures, relaxing, maintenance of the self, reading, um, and so on. Uh, one of the uh, things that I would like to point out here, though, is that as they are presented on this card, all of these activities are radically discontinuous. For Kershensev, subjective experience is structured as a kind of montage of discrete and unconnected moments. This card, in other words, presents a portrait of a conspicuously non-identitarian self. Here the card has something in common with the forms of montage for which Soviet cinema became famous in the 1920s, about which Yuri Tinyanov wrote, quote, every day cuts us up into 10 activities. This is why we go to the movies, end quote. Which is to say, if the linear narrative of the Bildungsroman, or the no novel of development, that in the 18th and 19th centuries provided a kind of cultural technical corollary to an ideal of the bourgeois ego as a kind of essential substance that remains constant across different, different activities over the course of an entire life, the card catalog, like the cut-up film, instead reflects and enacts a model of the self that is fundamentally open, mobile, and incomplete. According to Kershensev, this discontinuous self is articulated and realized based on its various contexts. For Kershensev, the psyche is not linear like a codex book, but open like a card catalog. Everything depends on how you organize the units. This was a lesson Kershensev made when, after 1917, he began agitating and organizing in the studios of Proletkult, which was the grassroots movement that sought to establish an independent proletarian culture. He and colleagues like Stanislav Krivtsev or Valerian Plitnyov experimented with assembling all varieties of collectives, artistic studios, theatrical collectives, even what they called informational collectives, which were groups of people that, that were convened to form a kind of organic computer that engaged in a process that they called vzaima informatia, or reciprocal information. One of the things that the prolet cultists observed was that group level intellective uh, or cultural products would change based on the scale of the ensemble. 
Thus, they stipulated that for the purpose of collective artistic creation, the studios must consist of around 20 to 22 people, no fewer, but also no more. Um, one of the really important aspects of this research uh, is the way that it provides a kind of counterproposal, I think, to the later gigantomania of the Stalinist era. Uh, the point of these prolet cult, um, uh, this, this prolet cult organizing work was that everything had to be scaled properly, uh, that a social group that was too large was just as disadvantageous as one that was too small. Uh, I mean, more recent research done by social scientists on, on political economy have similarly discovered that, that in fact, you know, trade, trade unions are weaker in, um, in larger nations. Uh, there are a whole set of extrapolations that one can draw from this research. Kirzhentsev and his collaborators were explicit not just about the size of these groups, but also their various topologies. Here are three diagrams from his book uh, titled The Principles of Organization. This is a system for labor. Here's one for education. Here's a, uh, a party system, a political system, uh, a network of communication within a party. The distinction in each of these ensembles is not just one of quantity, of scale, but also of quality. That is, each of these configurations is capable of releasing different abilities of the individuals who are participating. One of Kershensev's favorite examples that recurs in the later essays on organization was, an exa was the example of the Red Army, uh, here, seen here with, with uh, Trotsky, of course. This was, one of, this was the military body that was formed immediately after the October Revolution and that for uh, Kershensev exemplified the principle of what he called, quote unquote, reorganization. As he points out, the Red Army was at various moments in its history a military unit, a labor force, and an educational institution. One of the things that the Red Army was mobilized for was to combat illiteracy in the countryside, for example. The point for Kershensev is, uh, is that each of these various potentials, war machine, force of production, instrument of enlightenment, can all be found within one and the same collective. It just depends on how it's configured. What is so fascinating and instructive about this Soviet organizational science is how specific and concrete Kershensev and his fellow prolet cultists were. Their work provides us with a very different perspective on the relationship between the individual and the collective that is far more nuanced than the one that prevails today. Indeed, it seems to me that one of the conceptual shortcomings of progressive political projects that got us into the desperate point that we find, find ourselves at at the present moment is a rather undifferentiated and monolithic binary distinction that we have accepted between the individual and the collective. There's a kind of basic reflex among the left that individual is bad and collective is good, when the fact is that there is an entire universe of distinction to be elaborated between these two terms, since different forms of collectives, different social arrangements, unleash different human capacities. Take the heterosexual couple, for example, which Paul Virilio famously designated as the original metabolic war machine. Or the nuclear family, certainly a robust socioeconomic configuration within the capitalist system, but also, for Freud, the source of a panoply of psychic neuroses for the subject. There are many other configurations, the artiel or guild, the seminar, the trade union, the factory labor collective, the artistic krujok or circle, the church congregation, the tribe, the network, the nation state. Each of these forms of collectivity operates on a different scale and activates different potentials of the individual. To specify these potentials was one of the remarkable achievements of the kind of research that flourished in the work of the prolet cult organizers like Kershensev. It's an impulse that is beginning to be revived today, albeit somewhat less systematically, in a variety of grassroots and mesoscalar forms of political organizing that are now taking aim at the executive branch of our government. The prolet cult work reminds us that we have to take the problems of scale and network topology seriously. It's not just a matter of having the right intentions. It's a call for us to experiment with different social arrangements since organizational topology may very well determine the success or failure of a given political impulse. This can work both ways. Just as, liberatory, just as a liberatory initiative can be neutralized if placed in the wrong context, egoistic impulses can be transformed into altruistic behavior in a different context. As Immanuel Kant wrote in his essay on perpetual peace, quote, the problem of setting up a state can be solved even by a nation of devils, as long as they have reason, end quote. In a text titled Individual and Collective, Viktor Pertsov, who was a colleague of Rodchenko and who began his career as a secretary in Kershensev's organization, 
Pertzl have observed that the innate character of the individuals can produce different results depending on the organization in which she or he is placed. Often the shortcomings of the individual can be transformed into accomplishments within a collective setting, assuming this collective is correctly organized. Thus, someone with a restless character, Pertsov suggests, can become either a vagrant or a traveling scholar, depending on the society around him. As Rodchenko wrote, quote, a man is not just one sum total, he is many, and sometimes they are quite opposed, end quote. What matters for Rodchenko and Kerzhensev is not who you are, but how you are organized. Thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Sarah, Roxana, um, Hillary, and Senya for um, organizing this panel tonight and also for putting together such a, a beautiful exhibition. Um, like Sarah said, I'm in the process of publishing a book about um, Alexei Gan, one of the founders of Russian constructivism. Um, and I'm not going to focus on his work tonight, but I will draw on an idea that was very important for him and by extension me. Uh, that is uh, this idea of constructivist tectonics that you see in my title uh, in order to think about some of uh, the objects in this exhibition. Um, but I'm also going to start with him. The Russian constructivist Alexei Gan was always clear about the movement's final end. As he wrote in his best known text, The Booklet Constructivism of 1922, the communist city is the constant goal. Reading on in the same passage, it's apparent that his sense was literal, at least in part. The communist city would replace the bourgeois capitalist city's small, awkward buildings, eclecticism of architectural forms, and private property at every step, with a communist expression of material structures. That is, it would be a place with a particular arrangement of things. Yet he also seems to have understood the communist city as a state of mind, arguing that an essential component of the city building task was to organize human consciousness so that the workers could see the disorder of the capitalist city as simply and naturally as they see their own messy apartments. Living in the communist city meant comprehending one's dwelling as extending beyond the private apartment, at least sometimes, um, beyond the modern city, uh, sometimes uh, something like Marshall McLuhan's global village of the 1960s, Living in the communist city meant feeling and behaving as if one were living with people everywhere and in general. As in McLuhan's vision, the edifice of the communist city was as much the product of communication technologies as the work of architects that makes it possible to consider work with mass media forms such as magazines and films under the rubric of constructivist architecture. This kind of parallel between architecture and mass media has been noted as characteristic of modernity by others, uh, with the relationship traced and defined in a variety of ways with a variety of ends. Here I want to focus on will at least begin as a kind of literal connection uh, with a well-known sequence from Ziga Vertov's best-known film, Man with a Movie Camera of 1928-29, uh, one that follows closely on the shot that I'm showing you here. This is the sequence towards the end of the film where Vertov manipulates footage of the Bolshoi theater by splitting the screen and rotating each half of the image so that the structure appears to collapse in on itself. Excerpts of the film are currently screening in the exhibition, although this particular sequence is not included there a frame produced during the production of that sequence, but which does not appear in the final cut of the film, does appear in the exhibition, um, but it's in the next room, uh, where it's visible in one of the vitrines, uh, transferred from celluloid to paper on the pages of the journal Novoi Lef. So for one, this is a great example of the way that this exhibition allows for the mobile and multiple character of these objects to be seen how montage procedures were used to construct different objects to recontextualize and reframe. Um, and without going too deeply into it, working with this kind of open, um, uh, expansive kind of recombinative way, 
a way that allowed works to respond to environmental pressures in a sense um, was what constructivists uh, like on meant by working tectonically. Reframed within the pages of Novoi Lef, the image becomes part of a broader discussion about the potential of photography and cinema to cultivate a new consciousness in which viewers might see the world with fresh eyes. The journal was famously illustrated with Alexander Rudchenko's early photographs known for their striking oblique angles that defamiliarize their subjects. The image on the cover of the um, of the number where the Bolshoi frame is reproduced, number 10 of 1928, is not one of those images, but it does seem to comment on them. A frame from the self-proclaimed film about film, Stakhlani Glaz, or Glass Eye. It shows the cameraman, Anatoly Golovnya, gripping the outer ring of the iris, or the aperture frame, of a movie camera. The position of his face and hands with respect to the whole studded ring evokes both a ship's porthole and its helm. It refers to the old trope of representation as window, but with the difference that he's not stationary watching the world go by, but rather driving, directing our view. That kind of awkward reach of Golovnya's right arm to the aperture lever suggests that he might turn the wheel about 90 degrees kind of turning vision sideways to perceive perhaps something like Vertov's rotated image, or perhaps tipping it vertically in a kind of craned neck oblique instead. This reading is more or less consistent with the way that the journal's image program has been interpreted. Leah Dickerman's analysis of the radical oblique in the 1990s remains one of the more sophisticated like most commentators, she points to the estranging effect of the images, the way that they participate in the construction of a new vision. But rather than attach this to a celebration of modern technology, skyscrapers, elevators, and so on, as some have, she pushes their analysis in another direction. Indeed, one that almost contradicts the more common reading by suggesting a parallel between Rodchenko's oblique angles and the shift that occurred in understanding of language in this era towards the semiotic. These unconventional perspectives frustrate symbolic reading based on recognition and stable meanings and move toward a mode of constructing meaning synchronically and relationally. The relational aspect of the photographs is emphasized by their idiosyncratic perspectives, which call attention to the photographer's position and agency in guiding the direction of the lens. Now, I very much like this idea, and I even think that it is true. These angles are less about skyscrapers, and actually also, I think, less about estrangement than they are about the construction of meaning on the ground and in relation. Nonetheless, I'm going to depart from that mode of meaning making, at least temporarily, in order to pursue a direction that is iconographic and symbolic and note that a great number of these radically oblique shots take buildings as their subject matter. And while many take up modern examples, they certainly don't all. For example, there's Rodchenko's photograph, um, very beautiful photograph of the neoclassical columns of the Museum of the Revolution, also on display in the exhibition, and which also had an active life circulating in various publications. And of course, there's also Vertov sequence featuring the neoclassical facade of the Bolshoi. Vertov scholar Yuri Tsevian has also argued for a greater attention to the symbolic content of this sequence, questioning what he presents as the dominant interpretation that the collapsing facade conveys the confused mental state brought on by the fast pace of the urban environment. There's certainly ample evidence to support that reading, but still, he insists, we cannot ignore that this is not just any urban structure spinning in the viewer's overtaxed consciousness. It was an extremely significant structure, highly recognizable, indeed iconic, a symbol of the highest level of imperial artistic culture. As such, in the years after the revolution, it had been the center of a debate about the cultural values of the proletarian state, as well as a very real politics about the distribution of limited resources. As Lunacharsky commented in 1921, 
Every month, around two million rubles is spent to upkeep this theater. With that money, we could hire 4,000 school teachers, even if we paid them well. However ideologically clear the solution to that equation, the cultural authority of this structure persisted, even in a context where other symbols of imperial authority were readily toppled there seemed to be some kind of trepidation about liquidating the Bolshoi. The venerable edifice thus came to symbolize the stubborn longevity of cultural forms uh, well into the late 20s. All of this, Sivian concludes, is concentrated in this image of the Bolshoi. You know, if the film was a manifesto, as has often been argued, and Sivian uses that language too, then this is the line that reads, down with, down with the culture of the past. Vertov's straight on symmetrical framing, particularly marked in comparison to the irreverent nonchalance of the image on the left, encourages this symbolic reading. Indeed, in just the way that Dickerman suggests, the shot itself is the very opposite of the radically oblique. It cries out to be recognized as a symbol. Vertov relies on this to give meaning to his operation, the splitting of the screen and its rotation to produce the negation, the down with, that Sivian reads there. Yet I'd like to suggest that along with that negation, we might also read a constructive demonstration, a kind of long live, if you will. This sequence does not set the building spinning off kilter, as much as it compounds the logic of the composition, a logic that, note, was already doubled if you consider the architecture of the building uh, and the landscaping. Seen in this way, the sequence becomes a fractal-like extension of the logic of bilateral symmetry. The split and rotation just build on that by elaborating it into a temporal dimension. Seeing this constructive demonstration involves a kind of duck and rabbit-like shift, a recoding of the sequence less as an avant-garde manifesto than as a kind of architectural treatise on the construction of the communist city. Certainly the Bolshoi's classical quotations signified in the world of aesthetic and architectural theory too, as did the symmetry that Vertov makes a theme in his presentation of it, those of you who are art historians might recall that Heinrich Wolflin um, described precisely this difference in composition that I noted earlier uh, with the terms atectonic and tectonic in Principles of Art History of 1915, a text that was translated into Russian in 1922 and reviewed by productivist theoretician Nikolai Tarabukin. Wolflin, in turn, derived his usage uh, from German architectural theory of the second half of the 19th century. Their tectonics referred to the structural arrangement of a building, both the way that its elements balanced forces like gravity and the aesthetic expression of that structure through ornament. Greek temple architecture was the foundational example. Its architectural perfection stemmed from its tectonic balance of forces, its ability to independently hold itself together in the age-old struggle with nature to keep the roof up. In applying the concept to flat images, Wolflin pushed it in a sort of metaphorical direction, divorcing it from physical stability, yet he maintained the link to self-sufficiency. The tectonic composition for him was a closed form. Now, as I said from the beginning, a closed form was precisely what this era's mass media objects were not. Thus, when Vertov splits open and splays out the tectonic perfection of the Bolshoi's neoclassical facade, he's refusing that version of tectonics, but only in order to simultaneously redirect or reorient it. In tipping it towards a more horizontal register, he, um, somewhat like Wolflin, pushes towards metaphor, but in order to su suggest something quite different, indeed quite the opposite, that the forces that matter in constructing the communist city, the pressures to be balanced, 
were still very real, but they were no longer those sent down from above by God, by nature. They were those exerted laterally and horizontally by one's fellows. An editorial statement published in Lief, uh back in 1923 sheds some light on what this might have meant. It reads, earth shaken by the rumble of war and revolution is a difficult ground for grand constructions, but now there are no more earthquakes. The time has come for big things. The seriousness of our relationship towards ourselves, is the only solid foundation of our work. From the standpoint of the architectural theory of the communist city, a solid foundation of relationships towards ourselves is an interesting thing to think about. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's analysis of revolution, where she identifies the erosion of support for traditional foundations of authority as the central problem driving modern politics. She also develops her argument by tracing an architectural analogy Classically, she explains, society was conceived as a surface structure, a sort of edifice built on a foundation, uh, understood as located in the past, sometimes in the opinion of the elders, or sometimes in a founding episode. Toppling the elders was to overthrow authority in a kind of symbolic sense, but it was the model of foundation that allowed one to understand revolution as a kind of resting in the sense of extracting of the foundation from the past in order to reconstitute it in the present. It was a sort of synthesis of foundation and edifice constructed imminently in the politics of the here and now. It is this um, same hope or perhaps problem really that Marx and Engels also described when they very famously wrote that all fixed fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices are swept away. All that's solid melts into air, and man is at last forced to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Yet, once so compelled, how does one constitute authority soberly in real conditions and in relation with one's kind? How does one build a foundation of our relationships towards ourselves. Uh, what is, what are the tectonics of the communist city? Thank you. Hello, um, I too would like to thank um, Sarah and Roxana for putting this event together for this amazing show. And um, I am honored to be here and to be in such great company. And um, we're finally on the last paper. So um, my talk is called The Liberation of Women and Things. Vladimir Mayakovsky's long-love poem Pra Erza, about this, of 1923, was also a poetic indictment of the persistence of the old forms of everyday life after the revolution. The poem is about Mayakovsky's feelings for his lover, Li Brik, uh, whom we see here in Rochenko's famous photomontage cover image for the poem. But it is even more about Mayakovsky's worries that his own identity as a revolutionary poet and the revolution itself would be weakened by the old bourgeois practices and objects of everyday life that could not be swept away by military conquest or economic decree. The alert figures of Lili Brik and Mayakovsky staring out at us from these images, both of which are upstairs in the exhibition, represent the vigilance that characterizes the particular revolutionary impulse of the avant-garde that I want to pick up on tonight namely the impulse to transform public space after the revolution through new constructivist images and new kinds of constructivist objects that rejected the sexualization of women and the celebration of acquisitiveness, both of which had defined bourgeois art and visual culture. 
The photograph of Lily here presents her not as the attractive feminine object of the lover's gaze, but as a conscious subject, punishing and judging like the October Revolution, as a line from Mayakovsky's poem has it. Shortly after the publication of Praeta in the spring of 1923, Mayakovsky and Orochenko joined together in a more extended collaborative project, one of the best known projects of Russian constructivism, to use advertising and package design to transform people's attitudes toward things. Their business, called Reklam Konstruktor, or Advertising Constructor, promoted Soviet state-owned businesses. Rodchenko's package designs for the products of the state agricultural trust Mosilprom, like cigarettes, cookies, and caramels, and here you see his elegant design for the box for cinema brand Kino cigarettes, uh, these packages were small constructivist objects that entered directly into the everyday lives of Soviet consumers, more vi a more viable alternative to the constructivist furniture designs and clothing designs that never actually got mass produced. Even though this reclam constructor project re represents one of the key instances of the constructivist approach to creating new socialist objects, uh, it isn't seen in the current exhibition, which simply reflects the nature of the MoMA collection. The exhibition does include one subset of Rochenko's work in commercial design, so I want to just call attention to it here. Um, it predates his collaboration with Mayakovsky by a few months, um, and that is his poster, lapel pins, and even stationery for Dobralyot, the voluntary share society in support of Soviet uh, aviation because there was as yet no Soviet airline. It was early days yet. Um, and so this, uh, this pin here is egregiously blown up. If you see it upstairs in the vitrine, it's tiny, tiny. They're, they're very beautiful. Um, Mayakovsky's slogan for Mosulprom brand Ira cigarettes here on the right, bolstered by Rodchenko's insistent exclamation points and arrow, captures the constructivist impulse to clear away the vestiges of the pre-revolutionary past. All that's left to us from the old world is Ira cigarettes. Um, and the diminutive of Irina, or Ira, which is the diminutive of the name Irina, was and is one of the most common Russian women's names, suggesting a feminine aspect of the old world following them into the new. But here now, a femininity transformed necessarily by new Soviet laws guaranteeing equal rights and reproductive rights for women. The strategy of juxtaposing the outmoded capitalist past with the socialist present was ubiquitous in Soviet visual culture from state propaganda through the avant-garde. Yeah, skip ahead. Um, and our exhibition here, it was not our, your exhibition here, contains a particularly charming example of this. And that's the children's book Yesterday and Today, illustrated by Vladimir Lebedev. Um, and here you can see the, um, the traditionally drawn people of yesterday at the top are carrying around outmoded objects, a kerosene lamp, a yoke with buckets to fetch water from the well, and a fountain pen, which is illustrated with lots of blots on the paper inside. Today, in contrast, below, shows young upright workers rendered as flattened forms in bright, unmodulated colors. Uh, Lebedev was said to be very influenced by Malevich. And they're carrying the novel opposites of the old objects, an electric light bulb, plumbing equipment, and at the right, carried by the woman worker, a large black object that might look mysterious, but we learn from an interior page, is an Underwood typewriter, Underwood. Following on the before-after theme of the electric light bulb, a poster from 1925 visualizes the liberation of women through literal enlightenment. The bright sun at the top, uh, the electric light below, the electric lamp below under which the female worker is reading, newly freed from domestic drudgery, and the contrast between the dark jumbled pictures of the old world on the left and the bright orderly new life on the right. The poster might almost illustrate one of the most often quoted passages from Rodchenko's letters home from Paris about the light from the East, written in 1925. Disgusted with the commodity culture and rampant sexualization of women that he witnessed in Paris, he famously writes, quote, the light from the East is not only the liberation of workers. The light from the East is in the new relation to the person, to woman, to things. 
suggesting the closeness of constructivist ideals to the Bolshevik feminist campaign for a new everyday life, the Novi Buits. A key aspect of constructivist feminism, if we'll call it that, and I'm going to, was the central role of women artists within its practice. This exhibition includes uh, many works by women artists, um, although by dint of the nature of MoMA's collection, most of these are abstract compositions from before the founding of constructivism in 1921. So Lyubov Popova and Varvara Stepanova, example, for example, who are seen primarily in the show through their earlier paintings, prints, and watercolors, designed constructivist fabrics that were mass-produced, as well as theater costumes and mass clothing. Valentina Kulagina designed mass photomontage posters, especially on topics pertaining to women. Yet if the exhibition does not include many such art into life works by women artists, there is another way that it demonstrates Rochenko's idea of the liberation of women under the light of revolution. And here I present to you simply a realization that came to me thinking about this show preparing, and I realize that we have here an entire exhibition of modernist art spanning two decades over many mediums and styles that contain not a single female nude, not even a single sexualized image of a woman, not at all. And I submit that this is not nothing. The post-revolutionary Russian avant-garde participated in what Matthew Jesse Jackson has called the, quote, chaste public culture of the Soviet Union as a whole, which refused what Jackson calls the sex-death nexus of the prevailing image regime of the 20th century. And there he's using Jacques Rancière's term of the prevailing image regime. The objectification of women was by definition a symptom of capitalist exploitation, a remnant from the old world. Take this early, unusually lurid women's rights propaganda poster from 1921, where the older capitalist world on the left is represented by enslaved women, including a naked one literally on a slave block, enchained by a typically evil fat capitalist. In Marxist theory, the capitalist is always the cause of the oppression of women, not men in general. But any imagery of a sexualized nude, even when represented critically as here, would soon disappear from Soviet visual culture. If we jump ahead, we can find a kind of summary confirmation of this from a denunciation of such imagery from the end of the decade in 1929, which appeared in um, the journal Dayosh, Let's Produce, uh, a so-called public political and literary artistic workers journal. Um, that was produced primarily by members of the October Group, which was founded in 1928 as a kind of last stand of constructivism in the face of the rise of um, more traditional easel painting. Some of Rodchenko's most famous photographs of industrial objects were made on assignment for Dayosh, which became, this magazine became his primary outlet for publication after the demise of the journal Novi Lyev that we just heard about from Devon um, and also Kristen. Um, uh, and that includes this cover design for issue number six, which is in fact in the MoMA collection. But the article I'm interested in is on the right, um, and it's entitled Academic Binality, written by Alexei Mikhailov, a young architectural critic and October group theorist. In it, he attacks a fairly obscure entity, the Committee for the Popularization of Artistic Publications under the State Academy for the History of Material Culture. Despite its broad mandate, this publication of uh, our, our, all these artistic publications, he claims that this committee, quote, is interested in women and only women. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, he muses. Quote, maybe the committee takes an active part in the emancipation of working women. Maybe it popularizes the image of the new Soviet woman social activist, he asks optimistically. Maybe it, quote, disrupts the images of women created by petty bourgeois artists who see women as the property of the isolated family home and the bed as a thing whose only significance is to adorn and uphold the family coziness of the Philistine. But, ah, uh, he continues with disappointment, you don't know the committee for the popularization of artistic works. 
So the specific object of his ire you see here illustrated here is a series of postcards popularizing images of objectified, often naked women from pre-revolutionary Russian paintings. And he, he really doesn't like the artists that had, they have chosen. Um, and he calls these images anti-artistic because, arguing in concert with Rodchenko, sorry, with Rodchenko, they perpetuate the bourgeois view of woman as a thing. She's seen as, as a thing. This kind of outrage at the objectification of women and the perception that it was antithetical to the project of revolutionary art, or really to art itself, defined this visual culture across the spectrum of the artist groups and the party organizations charged with shaping it during the Soviet period. Um, so I've established that the exhibition contains no naked women, um, and it also does showcase a handful of avant-garde images of the new Soviet woman social activist that Mikhailov desired. So we've seen the female worker carrying the typewriter on the cover of Yesterday and Today, Rodchenko's iconic photograph of a pioneer girl looking into the future, Gustav Klutzis's First of May poster showing a broadly smiling woman, here at the bottom right, in ecstatic concert with the male worker at her side holding aloft a giant red flag. There could, however, have been a naked woman in the show. Had a different clip of Alexander Davzhenka's film Earth of 1930 been chosen. A poetic meditation on the cycle of birth, fecundity, and death, the film is framed by the story of Vasily, a young man who leads his village to form a collective and is murdered by a rich peasant or kulak. The clip in the exhibition upstairs focuses on the industrial montage of harvesting and bread making machinery after he gets all the collectivization equipment to the village. And this montage uh, bears affinities to Wirtov and Eisenstein. But the film's closing montage caused the greatest sensation upon its release because of its inclusion for the first and only time in a dramatic Soviet film until the late Soviet era of a scene with a naked woman. So now I'll do the anti-feminist thing of actually showing the naked woman that the exhibition managed to avoid. Um, so in this final montage, shots of Vasily's majestic funeral with, with all these singing peasants amongst the, the wheat fields are intercut with uh, scene, the scene of um, his fiance, Natalka, alone and naked, writhing and lurching around her room, crazed with grief. While her nudity is chaste and poignantly framed, the Soviet authorities were having none of it. Even before the film was released in Moscow, the writer and versifier Dem Demyan Biedny, who was close to the Kremlin, published a long rhyming screed against it in Izvestia. And so I'm just showing you just to see that it takes up half a page of this, this very large format newspaper. Quote, are we really going to force these sexual grimaces on the proletarian masses, he asks? And if the film makes it to the village, won't it add strength to the kulak threats? Brothers, do you see? The communists are stripping the girls and women to the point of nakedness on the godless kalhoses. The damned communists have no shame. So I apologize for not um, repeating, for trying not, not getting his rhyming, but you get the point of what he's saying. But this is all in, in rhyme. Biedny's sarcasm is spoken from the perspective of the true communist who would never strip women naked on the collective farm. Although Biedny's motives and his um, ascetic interpretation are highly suspect, I, I would say. This episode reveals again that outrage over the sexualized depiction of a naked woman in public visual culture was something everyone was assumed to agree on. It was not compatible with communist behavior. This, obviously, I would say, this form of feminism that I'm identifying here has little to do with the liberatory destruction of gender binaries imagined in our contemporary gender and queer theory. It certainly is not intersectional, nor, is it, nor does it necessarily involve a critique of assumptions about gender difference, such as the glaring equation throughout the film Earth of woman with nature, the, hence the sunflower in the woman's face. But this prohibition wrought a significant transformation of the tone of public space in the Soviet Union. 
This chaste public culture was dismissed always by Western critics, especially during the Cold War, as a sign of Soviet prudishness, evidence of the sexlessness of socialism, or more bluntly, its lack of sexiness. A phrase in, in Russia was, the Soviet Soviet is sex on yet. Well, there's no sex in the Soviet Union. But I think that we should resist this urbanity, this, this mocking relation to that, and its tacit embrace of the naturalness of the commercial objectification of women. There is no doubt that sexualized representations of women came roaring back with a vengeance after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Russian visual culture today is saturated with consumerism and sexism, arguably to an extent that eclipses that of other countries. Feminism in contemporary Russia is beleaguered and belittled. Despite the feminist, anarchic, and liberatory images of Pussy Riot that obviously caught the imagination of the international intelligentsia, the unfortunate takeaway from Pussy Riot is really the singularity, meaning the isolated nature of their feminist action in the Russian context, and, of course, their prison sentences. There were no women's marches in Russia on January 21st. Trump is greatly admired. I happened to listen to the radio station Echo Moskvy, the Echo of Moscow, on Inauguration Day, uh, which brought interviews from people on the street. A woman calling Trump an appealing man, simpatichny mushina, and a man admiring him for being super successful, super uspeshny, and for surrounding himself with beautiful women. Just yesterday, the New York Times reported that Putin signed a law decriminalizing spousal abuse because it is, after all, a family matter, and that the few women who have been protesting this new law are being ridiculed. Things are not exactly looking up here, either, on this or any front. And I assume that this pessimism has partly fueled the incredibly broad interest in this very smart and beautiful exhibition of revolutionary art. My title's reference to the liberation of women has its historical source in Orochenko's letter of 1925, but I also wanted to invoke the retrieval of the chants and slogans of 70s feminism from the women's marches last month. Looking back to the new left inspired feminism of the 70s and further back to the best feminist impulses of Soviet revolutionary culture, avant-garde and otherwise, is not a bad strategy for surviving 2017. Thank you. hear us. <clears throat> we won't have so much time for, for a Q&A, that's why perhaps I will just ask one single question from our panel, sort of an overarching question, just uh, since things have been brought all the way to the present in the last presentation, I would want to ask you, each one of you, perhaps you could comment uh, a little bit of what makes Russian avant-garde relevant today? Like, what is the afterlife um, of the Russian avant-garde? And I'm sure there are different answers, so maybe, um, Christine, we should start with you at the end. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. As a, as a historian, um, I think, I, I sometimes think, how is today relevant to the Russian avant-garde, or you know, how do I think differently about the historical material because of what, what is happening now. And I think um, recently that process has um, kind of uh, intensified and, um, 
and uh, you know the connections just keep coming. Um, and so uh, that's that's uh, maybe a backwards way to look at it, but um, but also I think indicative of of something very real. Um, and I think you know the thing that I think I was thinking about in my paper is um, is just about you know what happens when the institutions we've relied on to um, to uh, to found, um, you know, to stand on, um, are no longer really functioning in the same way. Um, uh, you know, do we reconstitute them, and how so? Um, so, uh, I think all of those were questions that um, that people were thinking about then, that artists were really thinking about then. Um, so, um, I think we could go on and on the mass media um, as well, the way that um, that sort of. Uh, become sort of unmoored and um, yet extremely important to the way that we perceive reality. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, this was kind of the the, um, the the point that I ended my presentation on, so I'm not sure I have a, a whole lot to add to it. I think one of the, you know, one of the things that uh, that in general I find very um, that I find very compelling about the uh, the work of the Soviet avant-garde is specifically there's a kind of there's a kind of uh, materialism, I, I think, that um, that one sees expressed in in a in a. There's a commitment to a materialism that one sees expressed in an almost and at times almost kind of embarrassing literalism and a sort of uh, in terms of the, the the application of certain metaphors and the realization of certain metaphors in a uh, in an in, in an incredibly literal fashion. But I find that 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 kind of um, there's a kind of you know, there's really a kind of audacity there that the that um, and a and a commitment to uh, to this idea that um, you know that one can really discover through kind of inductive a kind of inductive means certain a certain kind of experimentalism and um, so that that's something that I always it, it it's really um, it's kind of a you know it's a it's a it's a it's a formal it's a you know it's a formal laboratory it's a it's uh, and I think there was a there was a you know commitment to you know a certain a certain kind of experimentalism that didn't necessarily know what the outcome of these of these works would look like, and I find that um, I just find that a really radically and inspiringly um, materialist and inductive way of of working through problems in a very applied and, and applied materialist fashion. As in anti-commodification kind of materialism as an anti-commodity, right? Yeah, because it doesn't, um, yes, this is, I mean, it's, it's an anti-commodity. I'm not sure, I mean, I'm so influenced by Christina's readings of a kind of alternative Soviet commodity culture, if not commodity. I mean, there's a, there's a, um, uh, there are, there are, I mean, there was a certain utopia of commodities of a certain of certain kinds of consumption that were um, that were in fact considered, uh, you know, that were um, that were treated very positively. But it but it uh, but I think the difference, of course, was that uh, whereas in the West there was no, you know, that there was uh, there was kind of no. Um, Realization of the commodity's status as commodity. I think that the in the you know in, in this in the Soviet context, I think um, uh, the commodity always sort of you know wore its identity on its sleeve as a. Um, so I, I just don't. There there wasn't. Uh, yeah. So. Um, what I like about the revolution and this moment today. Here's how is this, yeah, this is quotable, right? What I like about revolution is, you know, looking at it from two sides of the ocean and the way that one can flip this history and how, you know, Christina's talk now at the end really highlights this, how we, or what I did also with my talk in part, is how, okay, Alfred Barr goes to the USSR, but then the works come here, the artists, certain things happen, certain things don't, institutions change. And we can think all we want about MoMA being the institution, but then there's also Barr with his, his own position. And there is always what I think is um, happening a lot is, uh, you know, now Russia is very much 
commodified and uh, absolutely, you know, forget capitalism, but it is something beyond that. And in the end, and in the end, what matters are the individuals and their sense of freedom and their sense of standing up for certain things. And the context shifts and flips. And I think there's a lot of craziness about the way, you know, Russians are now everywhere. We're just joking. Russians are everywhere. And I'm one of them, actually. Uh, <laughs> assimilate it, right? And then also so that, so that there is something about the avant-garde that just the Russian avant-garde being here at MoMA, being in a way preserved as it is. And this, my interest in this institutional history is, is that, that there is something very um, ephemeral about um, the ideologies. And if you remember that, there is something not ephemeral about the human spirit that that stands up to some certain ideals. And then this kind of um, ultimate nerdiness of some of the uh, most radical theorists and practitioners of the avant-garde is what lasts, in a way. Um, and then, in a, and also, the, this um, dedication that as scholars we can have to this material and to history and to being precise, whereas the ideologies can flip. So that's what I think. I think I've had my say, so I want to cede my time. Well, I agree with quite a lot of the things that have been said, but um, I think it's always good to kind of turn the question around and think about why should history always have to have a kind of purchase on the present? What about the present having a purchase on history? And I think that in terms of like, um, you know, I'm involved obviously in, the, in pedagogy and teaching young students. And, uh, you know, my thought is like really, um, to create a space where, where, where young people can understand that they have this, you know, right to experiment. That's the title of a very important um, a kind of set of fragmentary uh, fragments of a text by uh, Gustav Klutzes. Uh, this notion of a right to experiment that uh, uh, really, to, it's, it's like to try to sort of encourage people to understand especially, you know, the people that were involved in uh, teaching and also museum audiences and, and so forth, that things can be different. There can be a different model of um, social organization, aesthetic organization, and that we need to create that space. I feel like that's the responsibility of a historian. And because, you know, lately I've been thinking, I was thinking about this event and all the other events, you know, this is 2017. There's a lot of very controversial um, uh, discussion around like what really is uh, the legacy of this uh, set of revolutions in 1917. Uh, what is its political, economic, uh, social, moral, um, aesthetic legacy? So there's been a lot of talk about that and I was thinking about you know, our experiences that we have uh, you know, this past year, maybe year and a half. And then I thought, you know, I just don't wanna talk about that. Like, I really want to sort of allow there to be, and, and it's not an outside, it's, it's really allow there to be kind of competing voices. It's a little bit, you know, when Devon talked about the idea of a continuum between the notion of the individual and the collective. I'm interested in, you know, creating, or not creating, but um, trying to foster all those uh, spaces in that uh, continuum rather than thinking always in a kind of binary formation. So that's what I think we can give. It's also interesting because we often think about, um, you know, from today's viewpoint of uh, bars, you know, mission statement, and what does it mean today really? You know, because you cannot take it literally to, to the words. So the way that, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just thinking of Maria's, I, you know, sort of turning the question around and, and rather than uh, querying what's, you know, the afterlife of the avant-garde is how the present sort of casts a different reading maybe of that period. And then it made me think that <clears throat> in our evaluation, you know, constant evaluation of Barr's, uh, Alfred Barr's mission statement, we often uh, try to, to think what it means today, in fact, rather than just taking it to the letter of how it was written then. In, in deference to Maria's excellent point, I think we should open this up 
to the audience that we have here and, and make space for some other voices as well. I'm going to ask if we can just bring the house lights up a little bit. We have two um, microphones uh, roaming in the auditorium here, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Just wait till the mic gets to you so everyone in the room can hear um, the question. Can we bring the house lights up just a little bit, Mark? Thank you. We're really just doing it with like hand gestures. Hello. There we go. Thank you so much for the amazing presentations. I actually have a question, I think, for the first presenter to Masha Shlianow and to a degree to Maria Goff, who just uh, mentioned uh, teaching an experiment. Um, so in the famous diagram by Alfred Barr on modern art that uh, Masha have shown, um, he prominently features suprematism and constructivism right underneath cubism and Bauhaus just a bit beneath. But uh, he does not include Hutemas, the school that uh, is often uh, referred to as the counterpart of Bauhaus. And uh, I uh, wonder what might be the reason for this uh, conspicuous omission, given that Barr visited Hutemas at least uh, three times during his uh, Moscow stay that you've described. Thank you. That's a very specific question. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. I can hypothesize, but maybe I defer to Maria. Do you have any hypothesis? No. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very selective, just, it's a very selective uh, chart. And so, why do we want to see everything in there? I mean, Futemas is a school. Bauhaus, I agree, is a school. So, Bauh so the logic, I see the logic. But then Futemas is a school of constructivism. No, they're different, they're just, or do you have a specific observations that you, do, you have? Um, I wonder if uh, it was, you know, for again, political ideological reasons, or he really did not think that Futemas deserved uh, the place next to. No, I don't think it was a deliberate uh, leaving out of Futemas. I just think it's, you know, when you try to do something like this, schematic, uh, you, you inevitably have to leave something out and generalize. That's the general observation. Yeah. Just to add one thing, I think with that diagram, it's really important to think about what was its function, uh, because it seems I've always thought that its function was to uh, uh, educate um, uh, basically uh, a patron class that uh, is not uh, thinking about um, works of art 24/7, <laughs> uh, and so that it's a very kind of streamlined uh, argument. So, in other words, I have a kind of functionalist reading of, that, of that, 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 that diagram. I think it's about raising money for the museum. <laughs> Thank you. Maria. Um, other questions in the audience? We have one here in the front. I mean, for good reason. It's sort of bad thing to do. Um, did Alfred Barr read or speak Russian? Because would that have very limited him in terms of his interpretation of Russian art? Because if you look at the art without its context, without its political context, or with the context or without the manifesti that were being produced at the same time, wouldn't he have been very limited in his understanding of Russian art? Well, we know that during his trip to, to Russia, but that's not the same thing, as you know, no, as scholars, no. you know, that's not the same thing. It's just having someone, you know. Uh, indulge in, in conversation, but don't you think, I, this is one problem I have with reading contemporary evaluations, Western evaluations of Russian, Russian art, avant-garde, is that the people do not read Russian, so they don't know the political context. They don't know the ideologies, the, uh, you know, the motivations behind the artwork. They just look at it as pure abstract. But, but I don't think that Barr was completely a novice at looking, and he was in the studios of these artists, and he did have a direct contact with them. But when you look at Russian art, there's so much has to do with, the, with literature, with music. I mean, when you look at the avant-garde, it's not just a picture on the wall. It's all the arts being influenced. I mean, the idea that you're building from the bottom up, from destruction comes construction. And all the, and, and that, 
I, I, I find what Barr did very limited because he didn't know Russian and didn't know, know the language. And you don't feel this at all? Maybe I can. This is one of the points I was trying to make because what Barr did do is he very successfully inscribed the Russian legacy, that, that Russian avant-garde legacy, into the network of international modernism. And knowing Russian or not knowing Russian would not necessarily make one more successful at that. So the, the, I think what the genius of Barb was, and this, I'm sure everybody has their opinion on that, but my, my, my two cents is that um, the, his genius was to be able to see the trends, to be able to see the connections. He was brilliant at tracing connections, and he was also very good at finding people who would interpret for him in writing, or, and Leda is one example, Leda spoke Russian, and Bar trusted him. You know, if you want to go detail archival and see case by case how he made his conclusions, I find he was extremely informed in as much as I know. So I wouldn't, you know, I think it's, it's a common easy um, conclusions that we make. It's not easy. It's not easy. Okay, maybe it's not an easy, but it's common, okay. But it is a problem with the interpretation of Russian art and literature is when the people interpreting don't know the language. Yeah. Because they're not going to be interpreting. But at the same time, there can be, I mean, there are all kinds of other limitations. Like he goes to Russia and all he sees is the modernism because that's all he wants to see. There's that famous passage where he says, oh, they're doing so much interesting stuff, but I must find some painting if possible, right? Because he can't. And so, I, I mean, I, I take your point, but I think translation is one of all kinds of limitations and blinkers that, that's always going to take place in some encounter between cultures and um, he came back to New York and established a legacy that's been very powerful and that we're all still working through. Um, and uh, I don't know what the perfect accuracy would be, because if you have a total Slavophile who gets endlessly caught in, in every aspect of language and every Russian cultural thing that they can pick up on, I don't know if that's ultimately going to result in a better interpretation. It'll maybe result in a more thorough interpretation. No, I, I didn't mean that you were, but just... All right. Thank you. I think we, we're past our time already, so let's take one more question from the audience. You are right. Thank you. So let's take one more question. There's a, a hand in the back, Linnea. Um, I would like to uh, indulge myself and perhaps invite you to indulge in this exercise of um, juxtaposition of two diagrams or two sets of diagrams that we saw today. One is the Bart's um, legacy um, and the other set would be Devon Force diagrams of uh, organizations of human beings, individuals versus collectives and he said um, a range of differential possibilities that we need to think about. So I consider Bart's diagram as kind of thinking about genealogy and family of movements in our history as a world family or, or a global family. Um, mostly focused on, I guess, his geographic or expertise. Um, definitely at the expense of other parts of the world. Um, Asia, for example, or Africa. So how do we think about this individual versus collective, individual, individual and collective relationship that we can learn from um, Russian avant-garde differently with the different diagrams that we saw in Devon Force presentation and bring it back to perhaps art history, if that's possible. Am I making my sense? I mean, it's, is that kind of? I mean, that's I mean, an easy I question my talk for you. About, so I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not sure I, I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add to, to my, um, to my comments and my presentation. I mean, I think that the, you know, as you're pointing out, one of the major differences in those two diagrams is that one is largely a kind of, gene, Barr's diagram is a genealogical, um, it's, it provides a kind of diachronic um, assessment of, of these movements, whereas I think um, you know the the sort of the social diagrams that I was talking about, where they provide, I mean, although they do have a temporal aspect to them, at least in terms of the um, the the kind of um, the you know the, the 
circuitry that they that they um, that they visualize. I, I I see them more as a kind of as kind of synchronic diagrams, but. Um, I don't know, do other... Um... I mean, to me, I don't know anything about the diagrams actually that you showed us, but there were different types of diagrams too. And some of them were the way that you described them, but the others seemed to me more like um, looking like a corporative kind of, you know, structure with top, hier very hierarchized, you know, structure that would come down in a very... Um, systematic way that corporations are based today. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, as I, I was trying to show some different, some different topologies there. Some of them were, were sort of about production collectives. Others were, um, you know, edu educational pedagogical collectives. Uh, um, uh, and they're then even within forms of production, there are all different kinds of industrial enterprise, you know, from ranging from the industrial enterprise to, to, to agricultural um, uh, forms of production. But uh, I think that the, um, there's, uh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm hesitant because I, I think the, the sort of the, you know, the kind of morphological resemblance between the diagrams that I was showing and what Barr was doing, again, which is a kind of genealogical account, I think I see them as sort of fundamentally different, so I'm, I'm trying to parse that a little bit. But, but I think if there were an attempt, um, I mean, keep in mind that Barr made that chart in 35, um, and he was limited, as you're indicating, by his expertise and his geographies. I think if there were a, an attempt now, not that I'm sure that would be wise, to create a different kind of, as you're saying, suggesting genealogical chart, it would be much more nodular than the one that was produced in 35. I don't know if that kind of gets to your question. But I think with that, we're going to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to our fabulous panelists.